starting off with number 10 is Brandon Lawson. 26 year old San Angelo local Brandon Lawson was married to Ladessa Lofton and had four children. On August 8th, 2013, around midnight, he got into a fight with Ladessa and left the house to go to his dad's place. Unfortunately, that was the last time he was ever seen. Live. 45 minutes later, he called his brother Kyle, claiming he had ran out of petrol on the highway. A few minutes later, no one had any idea what happened, but Brandon made another call, only this time it was to 911. The call featured Brandon saying things like, I ran into somebody and that he was in a field and he needed help. When Kyle and a police officer finally got there, they both saw his truck on the side of the road, but there was no sign of Brandon. His keys were gone, so was his phone, but thankfully the truck didn't seem to be damaged at all. All of a sudden, Kyle got a call from Brandon, but the signal kept going in and out. All he heard was that Brandon was 10 minutes away from the truck and that he was bleeding. And that was the last time anyone heard from Brandon Lawson again. No activity has been reported on any of his cards, no outgoing calls. Apparently, he was chased into the field, but by who? Nobody knows. Coming in at number nine is Ben McDaniel. McDaniel was a scuba diver and on August 18th, 2010, he went for his last possible dive. Ben went to Vortex Spring in Florida and tried to access a part of the underwater cave that was only for intermediate divers. Although Ben didn't really have any qualifications, the Vortex Spring employees still let him go through, fearing he would try to sneak in anyway, get caught in the gate, and then drown. That was the last time anyone saw Ben McDaniel alive. Over a dozen cave divers would search every inch of the cave and it was determined someone Ben's size couldn't get stuck too deep in the cave. An above ground search which ran over the course of 36 days didn't turn up anything either. To this day no one knows what happened to Ben although some think he may have started a new life while others think the exact opposite. Coming in at number 8, do we have the Mapati Nasantra Airlines Flight 6715? In 1995, Flight 6715 went missing on a scheduled flight between Bima Airport and Satartik Airport, both in Indonesia. There were 4 crew members and 10 passengers on board the plane. It was believed to have met bad weather and crashed into the Molo Strait, but without any sign of the plane anywhere, we just don't know. In our 7th spot, we have Jennifer Kessie. On January 24th, 2006, 24 year old Jennifer Kessie left for work but she never made it. She was living in Orlando, Florida and worked as a financial analyst. On January 24th, her boyfriend knew something was up when she didn't send him a good morning message like usual. Then her coworkers were concerned when she missed her shift at work, which was very unlike her. Police think that Jennifer was abducted while walking to her car or while on her way to work. Two days later, her car was found a mile from her condo, but the police really didn't have any leads. Jennifer's mom told the police about construction workers in the area that would constantly catcall her and make her feel uncomfortable, but nothing came of this information. Then in 2019, 13 years later, the family received a tip saying that a woman remembered seeing a man dump a 6 to 8 foot rolled up carpet in a nearby lake. This was around the time of Jennifer's disappearance. But police have not shared any more information on this. To this day, Jennifer's parents are still looking for her. Now, number six is false information. This case was shared by Reddit user Guy in Florida, who said back in 1971, a woman in Boca Raton, Florida, reported her daughter is missing. Investigation led officers to find that the girl's boyfriend was missing too, and so was his van, which made them think the two lovers had run off together. Very Romeo and Juliet. Now, at some point, the mum hired a private investigator to look for the two, and she was eventually told they were both living in San Francisco. Another PI I told her she actually had a grandchild, but none of it made sense. The mom was supportive of the relationship. Their home life was completely fine. She just couldn't comprehend why her daughter would cut off all contact for no reason. It wasn't until 2000 that she finally found out the truth. There are quite a few drainage canals in South Florida that drain the Everglades into the ocean, and a lot of them are freaking deep. That year, a canal was dredged, and inside of it, they found the woman's daughter and the boyfriend inside the submerged van. So I guess this one is sold, but for a long time it wasn't. Number 5. Brianna Maitland. This one is super strange. Brianna was only 17 years old when her and her mother went out shopping. At one point Brianna left the store to go talk to a friend outside. When her mother finally caught up with her, Brianna seemed stressed out and she was acting strange. Following night Brianna left work early and just vanished. The part of this story that is so weird is her car was found next to an abandoned house. In the front seat was her paycheck and her purse, but it seemed that she had drove there on her own free will. There was no sign of a struggle. Animal. 
4 is Brian Schaefer. On March 31st, 2006, Brian Schaefer would meet up with his friend William Clint Florence at a bar called the Ugly Tuna Saluna. Very ugly name. The two would go bar hopping all night until returning to the Ugly Tuna just before 2 in the morning. Security footage shows Schaefer going into the bar but never leaving. Although the boys went out on a Friday night, Schaefer wasn't reported missing until Monday when he didn't show up for his flight to Miami where he was supposed to spend spring break with his girlfriend. The Ohio State medical student was grieving the loss of his mother and those around him say he took it incredibly hard, leading them to believe Schaefer may have taken his own life. Others think he may have been a victim of foul play and interestingly enough, his friend who he was with, William, refused to take a lie detector test. But that doesn't account for the security cameras not seeing him or someone carrying his body and leaving. That's the scariest part, where did he literally go? At number 3 we have Jacob Wetterling. This is a pretty standard story of kids hanging out and having fun. Jacob and his buddies were riding around on their bikes, checking out the town, they went to rent a movie, some pretty standard kid stuff. On their way back home, Jacob and his friends were stopped by a man holding a shotgun. Never a good turn of events. The guy told them to get off their bikes and then took each one of their bikes and threw them into a ditch one by one. After which he started to interrogate the kids at gunpoint. Eventually he asked them all their ages. After this he told Jacob's friends to run into the forest and not look back or he would kill them. The last time anyone saw Jacob was when he was being pulled by the man into a strange house. After that, the man and Jacob were never found again. In our second spot, we have the Sodder children. I've mentioned them before, but let me go more in depth because this disappearance story is, wow, just wait. In West Virginia, on December 24th, 1945, George and Jenny Sodder's home was burned down. Nine out of their ten children were in the home at the time of the fire. However, only four made it out. The other five seemed to have disappeared without a trace. Investigators believe that the children perished in the fire. However, none of their bones had been found. Initially, the fire was said to be an electrical fire, but the family's Christmas lights stayed on through the start of the fire. If it was an electrical fire, this wouldn't have happened. On top of that, someone had cut the phone line to their house, and for some reason, their car wasn't working. Now, here's where it gets more strange. Apparently, a woman claimed to have seen the five children watching their house burn from a passing car. Then, another woman claims she saw the children at a hotel a week after the fire, accompanied by four strangers. So it seems like the five kids were kidnapped. Still, their disappearance remains a huge mystery. And finally, at number one is Jalik L. Rainwalker. Now, Jalik grew up in the foster home. He was constantly moving, had no real parental figures, and was born addicted to crack cocaine because of his mother. He was known to throw violent temper tantrums, and it was so bad that they'd actually scare the kids away. Him. At the time, he had been living with Stephen Kerr and Jocelyn McDonald for five years, and they had legally adopted him. But the family was unconventional. They lived without running water, they had electricity for only a few hours a day, and the entire family slept in one room. Room. On October 23rd, 2007, Stephen called a crisis hotline to reverse the adoption because Jalik's behavior had become too much. Jalik was sent away to a previous home but came back the next day, but by this point, Care no longer wanted him around the house or around his children. On the night of the first, Jalik went missing from his paternal grandparents' house while Care was meant to be watching him. He left a note saying, Dear everybody, I'm sorry for everything. I won't be a bother anymore. Goodbye, Jalik. The note made it seem like Jay had run away on purpose or perhaps he had committed suicide since the boy was suicidal. Authorities however refused to believe that Jay had written the letter and despite living in a rural area, his body was missing. If he had died or committed suicide, it would have been easy to find him. Stephen also became a person of interest since there were so many inconsistencies in his story. Footage caught him leaving the house in his truck during the time he said he was asleep. He refused to also take a polygraph test but it was pretty obvious he was behind his foster son's disappearance. Coming in at number 10, we have have the Boeing 727-223 disappearance. So a Boeing 727-223 is a pretty big plane. In May 2003, one of these former commercial jets was stolen from the Quata de Fenterino airport in Angola. Just two years after 9-11, the world knew what damage could be done with a plane, so the disappearance sparked a worldwide search from the US Federal Bureau of Investigation and the CIA. Despite their efforts, no trace of the plane has ever been found. It is thought that the American pilot and flight engineer Ben Charles Padilla was on board along with a mechanic from the Republic of Congo. Many theories exist about what happened to the plane, but without finding the aircraft, it is pure speculation. In our ninth spot, we have Nathaniel Holmes. 
On December 19, 2017, 17-year-old Nathaniel Holmes disappeared from his high school in Westminster, Colorado. He had only been in a school for five weeks, but his family thinks that he got in with the wrong crowd. He reportedly got in trouble a lot, and the day before he disappeared, his dad said that he appeared to be on something. On the day of his disappearance, Nathaniel's mother dropped him off at school, but he never attended his classes. Instead, he apparently went to the principal and asked to speak to his friend that was currently in class. After being denied this, he left school, and that's the last we know about him. He left behind a lot of his personal items, like his phone was found smashed at home. Parents don't know where he went or why he left. Moving on to number 8, we have Maura Murray. On February 9, 2004, 21-year-old nursing student Maura Murray disappeared. She packed up her dorm, withdrew money from the bank, and emailed her professors telling them that she wouldn't be in class for a while because of a death in her family. But that was a lie. It was said that on the day she disappeared, she took out $280 and purchased alcohol from the liquor store. She got in her car and drove off. But at 7.27 that night, she got into an accident. She had driven the car into a tree. Police were at the scene at 7.45, but Mora was nowhere to be seen. The only clue left in her car was a printout of MapQuest directions for Burlington, Vermont. Her phone records that she had called the owner of a condo in Vermont, making them believe that she was headed there. After Mora fled from the car crash, she was never seen again. There were no footprints in the snow, and police dogs lost scent of her within 100 feet of her car. To this day, no one knows her whereabouts. So here are the theories. Number one, they believe that she fled to start a new life. Number two, people think that she died from being outside in the cold weather. Number three, she was abducted, or four, she was picked up by someone who murdered her. At number eight, we have Patrick Warren and David Spencer. On Boxing Day 1996, these two best friends told their parents they were going to visit one of Patrick's brothers. 11-year-old Patrick left his house riding his brand new bike, while 13-year-old David was on foot. The next day, one of Patrick's other brothers, Derek Warren, went looking for the boys when he found out they never arrived at their destination. Now, at first, police thought the boys had run away, then Patrick's bike was found behind a gas station. It took them weeks to realize it was actually Patrick's, and this led to an investigation which got very little media attention, but included the boys' faces being plastered on many milk cartons. Professor David Wilson, a criminologist, believes the case was mishandled to begin with because of the boys' families' working class backgrounds. The class wars, they just never end, do they? Although a suspect was named, there was never enough conclusive evidence to believe he was actually guilty. A police chief with a homicide unit went on record saying she believes the boys are dead but will not stop investigating until they have the answers they're looking for. Filling our number 7 slot is Ray Gricker. Ray worked as a district attorney in Center County, Pennsylvania, and on the 15th of April 2005, he randomly just vanished. Ray was skipping work as he usually did on Fridays, however when Gricker didn't come home, his girlfriend reported him missing and the cops found his car parked not far from a bridge. Ray was never seen again, but a fisherman found Ray's laptop months after his disappearance. Oddly, the hard drive had been removed, but was also eventually found on shore. Although it was too damaged to extract any information, investigators found searches on Ray's home computer that read how to wreck a hard drive and water damage to a notebook computer. Here's where things get even more interesting though. Some believe Gricker was murdered because he was part of an investigation involving Jerry Sanfusky, yet Gricker had declined to press charges back in 1998. Gricker retired in 2005, and something out of fear, he may have been set up to keep the truth from coming out. Ultimately, Sandusky wouldn't be able to stop the truth from coming out, regardless if he was part of Gricka's disappearance or not. The truth always comes out, baby. At number six, we have Virginia Carpenter. I want you all to picture it. It's 1948. Everything's in black and white. People are wearing long trench coats, and everyone always has a cigarette. Virginia was dropped off by a cabbie, but never made it home. She was spotted talking to two men in a car. Over the next few days, there are people who claim they have seen her all over the city in that car with those two men. The last sighting was a hitchhiker who claimed that she was Virginia, but after that, she was gone for good. Coming in at number 5, I personally find this really fascinating. We have the disappearance of Amelia Earhart. Amelia is an inspiration in so many ways. She was the first female to fly across the Atlantic, and she was known for doing whatever the heck she liked. Anyway, aside from her being an absolute major babe, she is at the center of a huge major mystery surrounding her disappearance. In July 1937, three weeks before her 40th birthday, Amelia disappeared in an attempt to circumnavigate the globe. It is thought that something 
went amiss in the Pacific Ocean near Howland Island, but to this day, nobody knows because Amelia's body and the aircraft have never been found. Many wild theories have formed, some suggesting that she made it to Howland Island and lived as a castaway. Others say she was captured by Japanese troops, and some even say that she faked her own death and is now living a new life with a new intensity in New Jersey. Of course, some of these do sound a little bit far fetched. But without a body and without a plane, we may never know what happened to her. Moving on to number four, we have the case of Cindy's song. In 2001, on Halloween night, 21 year old Penn State University senior Cindy Song disappeared, and she was never seen again. On Halloween night, Cindy returned home from a party at around 4 a.m. She dropped off her bag, cell phone, and took off her false eyelashes. However, Cindy herself was nowhere to be found. Police don't know where Cindy went. Now, a criminal named Paul Weekly did describe a woman that matched Cindy's description, saying that he kidnapped a woman in the area who he thought was a prostitute. He admitted to killing her and multiple others. The police found bodies of the other individuals, but never Cindy's. They think that he made up this story in hopes for a lesser sentence, but we don't know what truly happened to her. Filling at number 3 saw is Jimmy Hoffa. You may recognize the name because the Netflix movie The Irishman was all about him. Spoiler alert, he is missing. The mobster who is most notably known for leading the Teamsters Union and gaining clemency from President Richard Nixon went missing in 1975 and till this day has the FBI completely stumped. After being released from prison early in 1971, Hoffa would spend the next 4 years under the watchful eye of the FBI. Then he would enter a Michigan restaurant, presumably to meet with other mob bosses and disappear never to be seen again. Some believe he was taken out, while others simply don't even know where to begin. Hoffa was declared legally dead in 1982, although his body was never recovered, and as recently as 2013, the FBI was still digging up a field near Detroit looking for evidence. They didn't find any. Okay, we have some more crazy Bermuda Triangle stuff coming in at number 2. We have Flight 19 and the surrounding chaos as it went missing in, you got it, the Bermuda Triangle. I mean, would you fly there? I don't know if I would. Flight 19 were five Grumman TV Avenger torpedo bombers that disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle in December 1945. The pilots had reported that they were confused and disorientated before the designation of planes went missing. A Navy boat, the Martin PM Marina Flying Boat, went in search of the pilots, and that too went missing, never to be heard from or seen again. In total, 14 airmen and 13 naval crew members all went missing that day, and Navy investigators are still completely stumped as to what exactly happened. And in our number one spot, we have Rebecca Coriam. Rebecca Coriam was a 24 year old worker on the Disney Wonder cruise ship. She disappeared on or from the ship on March 22, 2011. At 5 45 that morning, she was seen on CCTV footage talking on the phone line, wearing men's clothing, and she was visibly distressed. After she hung up the phone, she was never seen again. At 9 am, Rebecca didn't show up to her shift. That's when the Disney staff were told to search the ship for her. This came of nothing. Then the US Coast Guards and Mexican Navy were contacted to search the ocean, thinking that maybe she fell overboard. Again, nothing. Here's where it gets interesting. Many people think that Disney knows what happened to Rebecca, and they just attempted to cover this whole thing up. Let me share the facts with you. For starters, the captain told Rebecca's parents that he believes that she was swept off of deck 5 by a big wave. However, there were no indications of stormy weather, let alone a rogue wave that night. The wave would have had to been 100 feet high to get over the 6 foot walls on that deck. Then the crew showed her parents the CCTV footage of her daughter on that phone call. They claimed that this was also from deck 5, saying that after the phone call she went out on the deck and that's when she was wiped out by the wave. But the footage was cropped to hide the timestamp and location. In fact, it was later revealed that it was from Deck 1, not Deck 5. On top of that, the Disney crew gave the parents a sandal that they claim was Rebecca's, which was found on the deck. But the sandal was the wrong size and style of Rebecca. Even a crew member stated, and I quote, Disney knows exactly what happened. That phone call she had, it was taped. Everything here is taped. There's CCTV everywhere. Disney has the tape. He believes that Disney has the tape that shows exactly what happened to Rebecca. 
but they aren't releasing it. They probably covered it up with fear that it will tarnish their happy family friendly reputation. At number 10, we have Felix Moncla. All right, we're gonna be combining a few things on this list. We're gonna have stuff here that will make you afraid to leave your door unlocked, and we have stuff that will have you running around with a tinfoil hat on, scared that aliens will stick cameras up your butt and put your brain in your dog's body. This one is a super eerie case. It's 1953, and some military radar picks up an unknown blip. It seems to be something that's just hovering. It's right over Lake Superior in Michigan, and the military wants some info about what this thing is, so they send out Felix. It might be a hidden attack from some leftover Nazis, who knows? Felix got into his fighter jet, sped off to figure out what this thing was. The people in the base were watching the two little markers get closer and closer and closer until it was right over the one at Lake Superior. Then it seemed like they collided and just disappeared. The official report was that he crashed into an enemy plane. But there was no signs of a crash, no wreckage, nothing. How do two planes crash into each other and there's no debris? Maybe Felix went right into a wormhole into another dimension. Or he was snatched up by aliens and they're putting cameras in his butt and switching his brain with his dog's brain. Who knows? Coming in at number nine is Mayumi Arashi. This one was shed by Red Yuza Sheep Floof, who told the story of 27 year old Mayumi. One day she left the house to meet up with a classmate and just never came home. Her older sister Yoko then called this classmate who claimed this meeting was never planned and they had never met her that day. The Arashi family was distraught looking for their daughter and what made matters worse was that Miyumi left a note in her room saying she had been betrayed and that she was sorry. At this point, officers had pinned the suspect to one of Miyumi's guy friends and let's just call him A. Just just like that. Now later on, A called Yoko and admitted he had seen her the afternoon she vanished and that if she ever wound up dead, he wanted to be in jail. The day after she disappeared, police officers followed A to a mountainous area where he was seen carrying two cans of juice never to be seen again. Again. The case started blowing up and her dad was interviewed about the case and during the computer interviews, viewers noticed a note behind Mayumi's door that no one had seen yet. On it, in Mayumi's writing, it said, don't trust what Yoko says. Dun dun dun. Was it the sister? We don't know. At number 8, we have Garnell Moore. This one is a really sad story. Garnell was a young boy with no real family. He was passed around from family member to family member, each taking turns to take care of him. One day he was just gone. People started asking questions, which brought the police into the picture. After a bit of investigating, it turns out that the last person who was taking care of Garnell was his aunt. She told the police that she couldn't take care of him anymore, so she left him on the steps of a child services building. But when the police went to check the place out, it didn't exist. But there was no evidence linking the aunt to the disappearance of Garnell. And the other family members didn't have any explanation of where he might have gone. So was the whole family just keeping one giant secret? We'll never know. Unless someone comes forward, then we'll totally know. Coming in at number 7, we have LIAT Flight 319. In August 1986, a scheduled flight from St. Lucia to St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the Caribbean went missing. On board were 11 passengers and two crew members, all now presumed dead. The aircraft made two landing attempts before going missing ahead of its third attempt. Many people believe that the plane most likely crashed into the ocean as a result of a failed third landing. As the ocean is some 6,000 feet deep in this area, searches for the plane have been fruitless. Making our way down the list at number six, we have Patricia Meehan. This case is definitely really unusual. On April 20th, 1989, 37-year-old Patricia Meehan got into a car accident after driving on the wrong side of the road. The other driver, Carol, claims that she saw Patricia get out of her car and just stare at her. Then she climbed over a fence and stared at her again before walking away from the scene completely. That was the last official time that she was seen. There have been reported sightings of Patricia a couple of times across the US, like at truck stops or hitchhiking along the side of the road. In May of 1989, a waitress reported seeing a woman that fit her description. She claims that she was talking to herself and seemed disoriented. Investigators think that she got a head injury from the accident, and along with her previous health problems, it caused her to develop amnesia. Sadly, we don't know for sure. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Charles and Catherine Romer. In April of 1980, Charles, age 73, and Catherine Romer, age 75, were headed back home from their yearly trip to Miami, Florida. On April 8th, they checked into the Holiday Inn Hotel and dropped off their luggage before heading back out for dinner. That was the last time that they were ever seen. Later, their car was found at the side of the road by a group of restaurants. Back at the hotel, none of their belongings were touched. There were no clues or leads to what had become of them. 
they just mysteriously vanished. Some people say that they were at the wrong place at the wrong time. Other people think that they were a victim of foul play since Charles was a wealthy oil executive. But we don't know for sure what happened. Coming in at number five is Rico Harris. This six foot nine former Harlem Globetrotter basketball player had definitely had his hardships in life. Rico suffered from a lot of hard substance abuse earlier in life, but had been clean for a while and was finally getting his life back on track. In 2012, Rico started dating Jennifer's song and the two began their long distance relationship. By the end of 2014, things were pretty serious and talks of marriage were being had. So the two decided to merge their lives together and he moved to Seattle for her. A few weeks after moving, he went back to Alhambra to see his family and Jennifer said he just went to get some closure. On the way there, Rico was completely fine. He met his mom and a brother and things were left amiss. He didn't get what he wanted out of the conversation and left that night to go back home. At around 10.45pm, he called Jennifer and told her he was going up to the mountains to rest so he hadn't gotten much sleep all night. At 11.15, he turned his phone off and no one has heard from Rico since. Imagine what Jennifer's going through. Like, how does your boyfriend, soon to be fiance, just disappear and never tell you where he went. Did he kill himself? What happened? At number four, we have Karina Sagers and Annette Sagers. This case definitely left a couple of boys and their father with some emotional scarring. In the early 80s, Karina Sanders, mother of three, just went missing out of nowhere. One minute she was waiting at a bus stop, and the next she was gone. Karina's family was pretty broken by this, but then in 1988, the Sagers' youngest kid, Annette Sagers, went missing from the same bus stop. Okay, hold on. How are you gonna let any of your family go back to the bus stop after one of you goes missing there? That's an accident waiting to happen. Here's where the story gets really messed up. There was a note left at the bus stop that said, Mommy came back, please give the boys a hug. What's even crazier is that the note was in Karina's handwriting. Are you serious? She came back to get her daughter but left her sons? Dude, this is gonna leave the kids with trauma over level 9000. In our third spot, we have Tara Calico. On September 20th, 1988, at 9.30 a.m., 19 year old Tara Calico left her home in New Mexico to go on a bike ride. She typically biked that route daily. She told her mom that if she wasn't back by noon to come and get her because she had plans with her boyfriend. That was the last time she ever saw her daughter. When she didn't show up by noon, her mother went looking for her and eventually called the police. Witnesses say that they saw a truck following her while she was biking home at around 11.45 a.m. Her Walkman was eventually found smashed at the side of the road. A year later, a disturbing Polaroid was found in a Florida parking lot. The photo showed a young girl that looked like Tara. She was bound up beside a young boy. Both had their mouths taped shut. Tara's mom claims that it was a photo of her daughter, saying that they have the same hair and same scar on their leg. Also, in the photo, there was a copy of the novel My Sweet Adrena, which was her favorite book. Seems like it was purposely planted there. Now, over the years, there have been several leads, but none have been successful. Sadly, the whereabouts of Tara are still unknown. Now at number two is Boris Weisfehler. In 1984, the 43 year old man took a trip to Chile where authorities concluded he drowned while trying to cross a river on a hike. The only evidence that Weisfehler was ever by a river was the fact his backpack was found near one. 16 years after his disappearance, US documents became declassified and it turns out a witness allegedly saw Weisfehler being interrogated before being shot point blank. This led to a new investigation and in 2012, a total of eight men including police and military officers were charged with Weisfehler's disappearance and kidnapping. Four years later, the case was closed and the men were all freed. Weisfehler's body still hasn't been found and his family is still looking for answers regarding his disappearance. Of course, at number one, we have one of the biggest aviation mysteries in history. We have the missing Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. In a disastrous year for Malaysia Airlines, which included another one of their planes being shot down over the Ukraine, Flight 370 went missing with 200 27 passengers on board and 12 crew members. The passenger flight took off at 12.42am and made its last communication with air traffic control at 19 minutes past 1 in the morning. This was before the pilot then switched off the communication system. Following that, the plane was picked up off course by military radar two hours later. It is an absolute total mystery as to why and many theories exist as to what took place. Some debris linked to the plane has been found, although they haven't really been conclusive. Some reported sightings of the plane emerged which further deepened the mystery. Some think that it's landed and people are being held captive, so who knows. Starting off this countdown, we have the Fort Worth Missing Trio. 
On December 23rd, 1974, 17-year-old Rachel Trillica, 14-year-old Lisa Renee Wilson, and 9-year-old Julianne Mosley all disappeared after doing Christmas shopping at a mall in Fort Worth, Texas. The girls were supposed to be home by 4 p.m., but they never showed. Rachel's car was found in the parking lot outside of Sears. In the car were the gifts that the girls bought that day. The police had no leads until Rachel's husband received a note from her. And before you say anything, yes, she was 17 and married. It was typical back then. Anyways, the note read, I know I'm going to catch it, but we just had to get away. We're going to Houston. See you in about a week. The car is in Sears' upper lot. Love, Rachel. But it didn't seem to be written by Rachel. In fact, it looked like she misspelled her own name and then tried to correct it, making them believe that someone else wrote the note to try and get police off their trail. To this day, we don't know where these girls are. At number nine, we have Brandon Swanson. Brandon was driving home late one night in Minnesota. He might have been drinking, or maybe he just wasn't really paying attention to where he was going, but he ended up in a ditch. His loving mother and father left to go grab him, but he wasn't where he said he would be, so they searched for him for hours. This entire time they were talking on the phone with him. While talking on the phone with him, his father heard him yell out, "Oh!" and then the phone just went dead. His car was found 25 miles away from where he said it was. A 500 person search party was sent out, but he was never found. Bobby Dunbar part one. Now this one is actually insane. Now back in 1912, the Dunbar family took their kids and went fishing at a lake in Louisiana. His parents decided to stay back while the uncle took the kids fishing. On the way back at some point, Bobby got separated from the group and the uncle only noticed when they finally got back. The family searched for him all over. The police looked for him for eight, four months, but to no avail. Eventually officers found a man called William Cantwell Walters who was traveling with a boy that looked a lot like the Dunbar. Bar boy. William's story about the boy was pretty sus. He said his friend gave him custody of their son, that his name was Bruce Anderson. The Dunbars were certain that Bruce was actually Bobby, and officers transferred the custody of the boy to them. When he was reunited with Leslie Dunbar, he even shouted mother, but it doesn't end there. A woman called Julia Anderson saw the story in the newspaper and arrived in town to claim the boy was actually her son, Bruce. Going on the seventh slot is Bobby Dunbar part two. Julia's arrival spiced things up a big time. She claimed she had given Bruce to William for a two day trip to visit his relatives and she had never given him actual custody of the boy. When the boy was put in front of Julia, he didn't recognize her at all and she him, which is again very sus. A kidnapping trial ensued and no one was really on Julia's side since she had already had three kids out of wedlock, two of which had already passed away. And think of the context, it's the early 1900s, people were judging her hard and questioning her character and I mean, it was the time, so I'm not surprised. Sadly, Julia wasn't even that well off, so she didn't have enough money to keep the court battle going, so the child ended up staying with the Dunbars. However, in a shocking turn of events, in 2004, Bob Dunbar Jr. did a DNA test, which showed he was not related by blood to his cousin, the son of Bobby's brother, Alonzo. So the boy was not a Dunbar, which begs the question, was he Bruce Anderson? And what really happened to the real Bobby Dunbar? Coming in at number six, we have flight N482U. New Pali Air flight N482U was carrying precious cargo in the form of a multi-millionaire businessman. This millionaire went by the name of Upali Wiljawani. Unfortunately, the plane went missing 15 minutes after taking off from Kuala Lumpur Airport in February 1983. The plane's last contact put it near Malaysia and the Malacca Straits, although a search of the area following the disappearance was never fruitful. A survival pack was found near the area that was believed to have come from the jet, but no wreckage was ever found. Coming in at number 5 is Lauren Spira. In the early hours of June 3rd, 2011, a 20-year-old student at Indiana University, Lauren Spira, would go missing. And it's very weird how little information there is on this disappearance. Lauren was with her friend Corey Rossman leaving a bar around 2.30am, and they were both pretty intoxicated. The two of them went to Lauren's place, then Corey's place, where he would fall asleep. Lauren would then try making her way home home but ended up at Corey's neighbor's place and would leave there around 4.30am which was the last time anyone saw her. Coincidentally when Lauren's boyfriend Jesse Wolf tried to get in touch with her he found out she had left her phone at the bar. After the 2015 murder of a 22 year old just miles away from Lauren's campus, police thought they may finally have a suspect. After investigation there was no connection between the two cases and to this day no one knows what happened to Lauren. At number 4 is Angela Hammond. The year was 1991, 20 year old Angela was engaged to Rob Schaefer and was four months pregnant with their child. On April 4th, 
forth, she dropped Rob off at a barbecue and an hour later she used a payphone to call him. While they spoke, she saw this creepy man circling the block a bunch of times in his green pickup truck. He got out of his truck and was looking around for something with a flashlight and Angela asked if he needed to use the phone to which he said no. Suddenly, Rob hears Angela scream on the phone and he rushes to the payphone in his car not knowing Angela's kidnapper was driving past him in the opposite direction. She yelled for him and he reversed abruptly breaking his transmission while he did so. And sadly, his car broke down and the truck got away and with it, Angela Hammond. The search for the truck began but to no avail. Police started questioning Rob since he had no witnesses to corroborate his story. But he did agree to a polygraph test and pass so he was telling the truth. Rob was cleared but Angela was never seen. This next disappearance was as recent as 2016. We have the disappearance of Indian Air Force Flight AN-32. This had 29 people on board. On the 22nd of July 2016, an Indian Air Force plane went missing over the Bay of Bengal. The aircraft vanished about two and a half hours before it was due to land at Port Blair. The disappearance sparked India's biggest ever marine search and rescue operation, but it was to no avail. By the 1st of August, all passengers and crew were presumed dead. At number two, we have Amy Bradley. Another situation of people trying to enjoy themselves and all their fun gets torn down before they can sip back their first ice cold margarita. Amy Bradley was on a cruise with her parents. She was getting day drunk probably, hanging out, having a good time, eating food, laying in the sun, all that standard stuff. But one day she was gone. Everyone was checking for her all over the boat. They were checking for her everywhere to see if she fell overboard. No one could find anything. The boat then docked in Curacao and a huge search party went out, but they couldn't find a single sign. Years later, a picture was sent to Amy's parents. It was someone who looked a lot like their daughter, but there was no information on the picture. And years after that, a sailor said he had spoke to Amy in a Curacao brothel. She might have been kidnapped on the boat and then sold into sex slavery on the island. And finally, at number one are the Beaumont siblings. In 1966, nine year old Jane, seven year old Anna, and four year old Grant would oddly disappear from Glenelg Beach in Australia. Their parents let them go to the beach quite often as long as they came home by their curfew. When the children left that day at 10 am and didn't return for their 2 pm curfew, the Beaumonts got worried. By 7 30 that night, their mother called the police, and witnesses at the beach said they saw the kids with a tall blonde guy with a very thin face. A local vendor also told authorities the kids bought a meat pie which was strange because the kids had never purchased one before and their parents hadn't sent them out with any money. This led to even more unanswered questions. Where did they get the money for the meat pie? Why did they even buy a meat pie? And most importantly, where did the children go? There's still a million dollar reward regarding their disappearance. Some think the man abducted them while others fear they were washed out to sea or Grant got pulled out and his sisters attempted to save him and failed. Honestly, when I first read this story, it really gave me a series of unfortunate events of I Babes like three children, Beaumont, Baudelaire, thin blonde man, Count Olaf. Are we seeing the parallels? Because I certainly am making them. Coming in at number nine, we have the Star Tiger. In January 1948, British South American Airways lost a plane called the Star Tiger somewhere over the Atlantic. There was a lot of weird things going on surrounding the disappearance of the plane, and it was heading from Portugal to Bermuda. This all helped perpetuate the rumors of the cursed Bermuda Triangle. 25 passengers and six crew members have not been accounted for since the flight disappeared at 3 a.m. on the 30th of January. Captain McMillan had delayed takeoff due to an engine issue, and then he met harsh weather conditions. Speculation says that the plane was blown off course into a gale before crashing into the ocean, although of course a wreckage has never been found. We have more on the Bermuda Triangle further down this list, so do stay tuned, because I for one am freaked out. Moving on to number 8, we have Maura Murray. On February 9th, 2004, 21-year-old nursing student Maura Murray disappeared. She packed up her dorm, withdrew money from the bank, and emailed her professors telling them that she wouldn't be in class for a while because of a death in her family. But that was a lie. It was said that on the day she disappeared, she took out $280 and purchased alcohol from the liquor store. She got in her car and drove off. But at 7.27 that night, she got into an accident. She had driven the car into a tree. Police were at the scene at 7.45, but Mora was nowhere to be seen. The only clue left in her car was a printout of MapQuest directions for Burlington, Vermont. Her phone records that she had called the owner of a condo in Vermont, making them believe that she was headed there. After Mora fled from the car crash, she was never seen again. There were no footprints in the snow, and police dogs lost scent of her within 100 feet of her car. To this day, no one knows her whereabouts. So here are the theories. 
Number one, they believe that she fled to start a new life. Number two, people think that she died from being outside in the cold weather. Number three, she was abducted or four, she was picked up by someone who murdered her. At number seven, we have Henry Avery. Let's move on to a happier story. This one is about one of the most bad dudes who ever lived. Henry Avery was known as King of the Pirates. This dude probably drank more rum and spread more chlamydia than six Charlie Sheens taped together. Between the years of 1694 and 1696, this dude was notorious and took down over five different ships for everything they were worth. His biggest get was the Ganyi Sawi. Him and his crew of dirty, scurvy written debauchees took over this boat and what they found wasn't just a bunch of fruit and booze, but 600,000 pounds worth of gold and silver. This guy literally won the pirate lottery. If we do a little conversion on this bad boy, the take was worth 52 million dollars. Actually over 52 million dollars. This guy was now the biggest baller in town. He was the most loaded pirate who had ever lived. He split his money with the rest of his crew and then disappeared. No one ever saw this bad again. He was lost to the world and probably became a king somewhere and died from having too much sex. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Charles and Catherine Romer. In April of 1980, Charles, age 73, and Catherine Romer, age 75, were headed back home from their yearly trip to Miami, Florida. On April 8th, they checked into the Holiday Inn Hotel and dropped off their luggage before heading back out for dinner. That was the last time that they were ever seen. Later, their car was found at the side of the road by a group of restaurants. Back at the hotel, none of their belongings were touched. There were no clues or leads to what had become of them. They just mysteriously vanished. Some people say that they were at the wrong place at the wrong time. Other people think that they were a victim of foul play since Charles was a wealthy oil executive. But. We don't know for sure what happened. Coming in at number four, we have Pakistan International Airlines Flight 404. 28 years on, and this aviation incident is still a huge mystery. In August 1989, a passenger jet carrying 49 passengers and five crew members disappeared amid a domestic flight in Pakistan. On the plane's way to Islamabad, one of the pilots made a routine radio call at 7:40 a.m., and then that was the last it was ever heard from. Many think that the aircraft crashed into the Himalayas, although a wreckage or not even a trace of one has ever been found. Stacy is Stacey Aris. Back in July of 1981, 14 year old Stacy, her dad and four others went to Sunrise High Sierra Camp on horseback. It was built as a tourist destination 20 years prior and it's the final stop in Yosemite's mountain chalet loop. When they got there, Stacy told her dad she wanted to take photos of the nearby lake and although he didn't go with her, an elderly man from the group did instead. At some point on the way there, he got quite tired and sat down so Stacy carried on the journey by herself. Self. A few hours later, the man returned to the camp without Stacy, claiming he waited for ages, but she never walked back. A tour guide in the group said he saw her from afar, standing on a rock about 50 yards south of the trail. So there's no way she could have gotten lost, but she was never seen again. Did she accidentally drown in the lake? Did she in fact get lost? I mean, the lake was only one bluff away from the camp, but she was only 14 years old. Maybe the sun was setting, it was getting dark, and she kind of just lost her way. Now, the two is Kelly Sue Ahrenek. At the end of September 2008, Kelly Sue was living with her daughter and her husband who she had had a troubled marriage with. She left work at 9.30pm to go home, but she never made it back. At 2am that night, her car was found utterly destroyed and on fire only three blocks away from her house. But the route it was found on wasn't the one that she normally took home, so already the situation was odd. Personality-wise, Kelly Sue was bullied as a child and therefore had self-esteem issues growing up. She was also clinically depressed and stopped taking her medication shortly before her disappearance. Was it a suicide? Maybe she burnt her car to make it look like she had gotten into an accident just to restart her life somewhere else. We will never know. Number one spot, we have Joan Gay Crop. In 1947, a massive tornado swept through middle America. It was knocking the hell out of everyone's home and killed over 100 people. One of these people was Joan's mother. Joan's father managed to survive, but he was severely injured. Joan and her family members were brought to a local hospital, and Joan and her brother were told to stay in the basement. Just in case another tornado came through town, this would be the safest place to be. It wasn't long after the family got settled into the hospital that two men in army uniforms arrived. They were searching for Joan. The hospital staff complied with the men even though they had no idea who these two men were. Joan left with them and then she was gone forever. 
She was only four years old when this happened. Starting off this countdown, we have Cicada 3301. Now, this is one of the most famous internet mysteries of all time. So, it all started in 2012 when a mysterious organization, Cicada 3301, posted a weird message on 4chan. According to the message, there was a secret hidden within their posted image, and they were recruiting highly intelligent individuals to try and solve it. They said that solving this would lead them on the road to finding them, and that they looked forward to meeting those that solved it. Well, it turns out that by opening the image file in a text editing app, a string of characters would appear. When decoded, it led users to a website with even more weird messages. Some say that they solved the mystery. Others say that those who completed the puzzle are recruited for something and are never heard from again. What are they recruited for though? That's what I would like to know. In our ninth spot, we have Heaven's Gate. This was a creepy and popular American religious cult on the internet that believed in UFOs. In 1997, police found 39 members of the cult dead inside of a house. Apparently, the members took their lives in order to ascend and board an extraterrestrial spacecraft and go to another planet. They were all found wearing arm patches that read Heaven's Gate Away Team. To this day, the website is still up and running, and no one knows who's running it. Now, in 2015, the administrators behind the website did do an email interview. In the interview, they called themselves TELA, which stands for the evolutionary level above humans. They claim that the dead members are actually alive and have transcended their human bodies and that they will come back eventually. To this day, their identity still remains unknown. In our eighth spot, we have Chip Chan. This is one internet mystery that has always left me unsettled. Chip Chan is the name given to a Korean woman that was discovered in a 4chan webcam thread in 2008. It immediately caught the attention of a number of people because the footage revealed this woman sleeping in unusual positions for long periods of time at unusual times of day. In fact, at first, people thought that she was dead. She also sleeps in weird positions like on a chair or on the floor. After doing further investigation, users found that this woman believes that a mind control weapon was implanted into her ankle bone and under her left eyebrow. This chip is said to control her and that's what's making her sleep all the time. She also claims that she is being held by a corrupt officer named P and that she installed these webcams into her home so that she can see what happens to her when she's sleeping. This story is just so freaking creepy and I don't think it's ever been solved. In our seventh spot today, we have Kanye Quest. Yep, not Kanye West, Kanye Quest. Kanye Quest 3030 is an RPG game that was released in 2013. Now, it seems just like a silly game. It centers around Kanye West, who on his way to take out trash, travels through a wormhole and into the future. He then has to take down an evil dictator. And you got Tupac, Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre in it, and you can have a rap battle with them. Now, the game seems pretty harmless. That was until a player found out the game's dark secret. At one point in the game, you can interact with a displayed message. It seems like gibberish at first, until people realized it said, ascend and worship the based god. Further on in the game, you are asked to enter a prompt and you can type anything you want. But if you type ascend, the whole game changes and you're put in this secret area. Eventually, players got to a screen that congratulated them on being an open-minded and curious thinker. They then instructed the player to not tell anyone about what they found. It then asks if you wish to participate. If you click yes, then they give you instructions on an exercise that you need to complete. Furthermore, players discovered a QR code that led to a now defunct website. In the end, it was discovered that the game has been tied to the religious cult of Ascensionism and to a mysterious company, Ascension Records. The true meaning of the secret of this game has remained unsolved to this day. Coming in at number six, we have Jack Frozy. Now, there are a number of creepy pastas out there about someone dying and then their loved ones receive phone calls or Facebook messages or texts from the dead person. Well, this actually happened in real life. Jack Frozy was a 32-year-old man from Dunmore, Pennsylvania. In June of 2011, he died suddenly and unexpectedly from a heart arrhythmia. Five months after Jack's death, his friend received an email from Jack's account with the subject line, I'm watching. Soon, his family started getting emails from Jack as well. 
Now, of course, they didn't believe it to be Jack for a second, but whoever it was, they knew intimate details regarding his friends and family, details only Jack would know. To this day, no one knows who sent these emails. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with GhostNet. This is the name given to a large scale cyber spying operation uncovered in 2009. In fact, it has been described as one of the most extensive operations ever uncovered. Yet, no one knows who was behind this operation. So in 2009, it was found that an organization infiltrated over 1,000 computers across 103 countries. They did this by sending emails with attachments or links to individuals or organizations. By opening the file, the user would unknowingly download a virus onto their computer that allowed the hackers to gain complete control of their computers so they could read and send data and even turn on someone's webcam and microphone. Like I said, no one knows who was behind this. But since the network originated in China, some believe that the Chinese government had something to do with this. Others believe that the CIA or the Russian government were behind this. In our fourth spot, we have the most mysterious song on the internet. This is the title given to a song with an unknown name, sung by an unknown artist with an unknown origin. It all started when a man named Darius came across an old cassette and liked a song on there and wanted to find the name of it. Him and his sister couldn't figure it out, so they turned to the internet for help. Soon, thousands of music enthusiasts came forward to try and figure out this song. To this day, no one has figured out who's behind this song, hence why it's given the name the most mysterious song on the internet. What's even weirder is when the song was shared online, a number of people recognized it. They said that they have heard it before, they just can't put their finger on it. In our third spot, we have Markovian Parallax Denigrate. This mystery started back in the 90s and revolves around a number of weird and confusing posts that appeared to be complete gibberish. Back then, there was something called Usenet, which was like a forum. On August 5th of 1996, hundreds of weird messages started appearing on Usenet. No one knew what they meant, but people knew that they were related because each post had one thing in common. The subject line read Markovian Parallax Denigrate. Turns out that these are secret codes, but no one has been able to crack them yet. In our second spot, we have Ted the Caver. Now, some say this is merely just a creepy pasta, whereas others believe it's a true story. I'll let you decide what you want to think. Back in February of 2000, a man known only by the name of Ted the Caver posted about exploring an unknown virgin cave passage in the US. According to Ted and his journal entries, when him and his friend entered the cave, they found a narrow passageway with a small hole. So they drilled the hole and decided to explore it further. But as they went to explore this cave, weird things began to happen. Him and his friend heard ghastly screaming, they found weird hieroglyphs on the cave walls, and apparently encountered evil spirits in the cave that followed them home. All of this was backed up with images of him and his friend exploring the cave. The last post was on May 19, 2001, when Ted revisited the cave and said he would update everyone when he returned home. He never updated the post, making people believe that he never returned home. In fact, this mystery was so popular that a horror movie was made off of it. And in our number one spot today, we have the Lake City Quiet Pills. Now, this is another very weird and wild one. So it starts with the death of a Reddit user, Religion of Peace. He was a moderator for the subreddit Jailbait, which is disturbing on its own. But he mainly posted about his military experience and guns, and would encourage posts to get people to upload pictures on his website, LakeCityQuietPills.com. But as many investigated his site, they realized that hidden inside the site's HTML code was a motto. It said, and I quote, dispensing Lake City quiet pills to lousy bastards in need of permanent rest since 1968. It continued on saying, Shade is maintaining the calendar and access to the file dump. Angel has the job postings for EU and Asia. We aren't sending anyone to me. No one. Don't ask for listings. Then what followed were what appeared to be job listings. Here are some. Immediate need, 8 to 10 Chinese Korean, fluent Korean dialect accent details after contact 12 week half pay and they went on to say that they needed Arabic French people no papers no problems a lot of people then theorized that this site was used as a way to pass assassination jobs back and forth. As people dug further, they found a government-owned bullet factory in Missouri called Lake City Ammunition Plant. 
Meaning, the quiet pills that they're referring to are bullets. I mean, yeah, you get shot by one of those and you'll be quiet. So maybe this website was a front for some illegal activity. Starting off this countdown, we have A858. In 2011, a Reddit user posted a strange and indecipherable code to the subreddit RA858DE45F569BC9. Very long, so people refer to it as A858 for short. On the subreddit, this user would post puzzles and cryptic messages. It gained a lot of traction and people were desperately trying to crack these puzzles. No one has been successful to this day. Things got strange when the original poster disappeared for four years. When they came back in 2015, that's when he began dropping subtle hints, including a message that when decoded, it revealed an image of Stonehenge. Sadly, in 2016, the page became private, and I believe that it still is private. In our ninth spot, we have Publius Enigma. This is an unsolved puzzle or riddle that was posted on the internet by a user named Publius. Basically, they said that there was a message hidden in the 1994 Pink Floyd album, Division Bell. Many people have tried to solve this puzzle, but none have been successful. It was said though that whoever solved the riddle would be given a reward. Now, the band denied any association with this riddle, and if that's the case, Who's behind it? How do you solve it? And what is the reward? In our eighth spot, we have Gary McKinnon. In 2002, Gary McKinnon was determined to figure out if aliens were real. He spent hours researching them and trying to figure out what NASA was hiding. That's when he decided to hack into NASA to see what he could find. In the end, he discovered an image of some sort of strange flying aircraft in the sky. When NASA noticed that an outsider had obtained this information, his access was shut off. Of course, NASA has always denied Gary's claims on the UFO photos that he saw. In the end, Gary was let off the hook, but to this day, we don't know if what he saw was real, or if he made it up, or what. In our seventh spot, we have Unfavorable Semicircle. This is said to be YouTube's strangest mystery. It started in March of 2015, when a YouTube account with the title Unfavorable Semicircle was created. From there, they started to post weird cryptic videos all titled with the Sagittarius symbol and then random numbers. The videos were often of abstract pixelated images. Some videos were accompanied with weird and distorted sounds. In fact, in some of the videos, you can hear a muffled male voice breathing or reciting random letters or numbers. This channel posted thousands of these weird cryptic videos. To this day, nobody knows what the videos mean or who's behind them. Now here's where it gets weird. A bunch of Reddit users became determined to solve this mystery. From there, the channel gained a lot of attention. But as soon as this happened, YouTube suspended the account without explanation. The videos are basically lost forever. All that's left are bad screen recordings of them. Moving on to number six, we have the Plague Doctor video. This is another very famous video on YouTube. The video features a person dressed in a Plague Doctor mask, doing a bunch of weird stuff in a rundown building. Now, the video title was in binary code. When translated, it spelt out death in Spanish. How creepy is that? Not only that, but the video is filled with an awful buzzing sound. And apparently, if you put this buzzing sound into a spectrogram, which basically gives you a visual representation of the sound, it apparently makes the shape of a woman who's being harmed. To this day, no one knows what's up with this video, or who's behind it, or what it means. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with our creepy. Now this is another part to that creepy plague doctor video. So when that video became viral, the subreddit our creepy became devoted to solving this mystery. However, along the way, some mysterious people started posting weird messages in the forum. One was a Morse code message that when translated said, red lips, life tenth. Don't know what that means at all. And then they also posted, 2015, there will be three. Again, no one knows what this means. Other messages included a list of chess moves, the coordinates to the White House, and coded disturbing images depicting violence against women. To this day, no one has been able to solve this mystery or find out who's behind all these posts. In our fourth spot, we have the deep web. The term deep web refers to the 80% of the internet that is inaccessible through normal internet browsers. And there's a reason why. 
The stuff on the deep web can be traumatizing. One person stumbled upon an online bid. When the bidding ended, it was revealed that they were bidding on a woman who was tied to a chair. The winning bidder could type what they wanted to do to her. Turns out that this was a torture murder live stream. Moving on to number three, we have Mariana Mortegard Glesgorf. Excuse me, I know I just butchered that name. But this is apparently one of the scariest and most haunted videos on the internet. This video was posted on YouTube in 2008 and immediately unsettled everyone who watched it. it. Starts off with some man just staring into the camera, then out of nowhere, he starts laughing maniacally. In the next section of the video, we see a man with weird, creepy eyeballs. Now, the full video is two minutes long. However, you are warned never to watch the full video. It is said that if you do, it'll drive you insane. In fact, the entire video was apparently removed off of YouTube after 100 people took out their own eyeballs after watching this video and then mailed them to YouTube's main office in San Bruno. To this day, we don't know who created this video, why, and who's that man in the video. In our second spot, we have the killer. A number of killers have apparently used forum sites like 4chan to ask some pretty disturbing questions and tease others. On 4chan, one person discovered a post where someone asked what they keep in their freezer. This person replied with a picture of dead body parts in their freezer. Another killer decided to play a little game with some people on 4chan. He said that there was a missing person, and if they guessed who it was correctly, then they would give them a freebie and then coordinates to where her body was buried. And I don't know if she was ever found. And in our number one spot today, we have how to be a serial killer. Now, this is the name of a website, thankfully no longer active, that used to teach people how to become a serial killer. The site was full with detailed explanations on how to kill people and get away with it. Eventually, the site was removed, but when you searched for it, a message popped up saying, how to be a serial killer has been removed. If you're really interested in killing someone, why don't you start with yourself? Oh, uh, excuse me? No. Okay, sorry. Uh, we still need to know who created this site and why. Coming in at number nine, we have Mr. Bear. This next story is so bizarre and some even believe that it's true. Apparently in 1999 in Caledon, Ontario, they had a local TV channel called Caledon Local 21. Now on this channel, they had a children's show called Mr. Bear. Now we wish that this show was about cute friendly bears like Care Bears, but it definitely wasn't. Now, this show featured a man dressed in a bear suit. Each episode, he would welcome their guest, always a child. He would bring the child into the cellar and play games with them. It is said that he used the show to lure children to him. Some people claim to remember the show. Other people have gone as far as to creating some episodes in a parody type fashion. I just find this very disturbing. For number eight, we have Charlie Charlie. Have any of you heard the saying, Charlie, Charlie, are you there? Well, it's part of a game designed to apparently contact the ghost Charlie. Charlie was a young boy who tragically passed away. Some people say he passed away in a car accident, others say he took his own life. And he has now come back to haunt whoever contacts him. Players that play this game are supposed to place two pencils overlapping each other to form a cross. The pencils are placed on top of a piece of paper that have two sections, yes and no. After they summon Charlie, apparently they can communicate to him through this contraption, using only yes or no questions. Charlie's end goal is to terrorize and harm any Anyone who plays this game, I wouldn't define it as a game because it's not fun, it's just scary and dumb, don't play it. Coming in at number six, we have Momo. In 2019, a viral picture spread around the internet. I'm sorry for the image that you're about to see because it gives me the creeps looking at it. This photo features a girl with huge bulging eyes, straight greasy hair, and a thin large mouth. Apparently this girl's name is Momo and she is a demon or ghost that's goal is to get people to harm themselves. Now a virtual game type challenge started going around on apps such as WhatsApp or even Snapchat where apparently Momo would command people to do tasks that would lead them to commit acts of extreme violence. Other people said that Momo would appear in kids shows like Peppa Pig or in popular games like Fortnite to try and attract kids. 
don't worry, this is a hoax. I did tons of research because I was so scared. I wanted to make sure that it was indeed fake. So, you're welcome. So the picture of Momo is actually a sculpture made by the Japanese artist Kasuki Asawa. He titled this piece of art Mother Bird. When people saw the photo, that's when they started creating a story surrounding it. In our fourth spot, we have Bloody Mary. Now, I'm not talking about the cocktail here. I wish I was. I feel like most people have heard of this story. It was really popular when I was a kid. In fact, I was stupid enough to try it with my friends and thank gosh, Nothing happened. So this legend surrounds a ghost named Bloody Mary. It spooks me just even saying her name. <laughs> now it is said that if you enter the bathroom, turn off the lights and look in the mirror and chant her name three times, nice try, I'm not gonna say it for the video, then she will appear in the mirror and potentially scratch you. Now there are a lot of variations of the story. Some say you must be holding a lit candle, others say you need to spin around three times while saying her name, or even by saying, Bloody Mary, I believe in you. I swear guys, if I get haunted for just talking about these stories, I'm not gonna be happy. This is the one story that I kind of believe just because my friends have done it and have witnessed paranormal stuff. But who knows? All I know is that I will never do it. Coming in at number three, we have the girl in the photograph. Word from the wise, if you find a random photograph on the ground, don't go picking it up. Let me explain why. This legend revolves around a beautiful girl that changes her appearance based on her victim. Basically, whoever finds the photograph of her will become infatuated with her. She uses her beauty to brainwash her victims and then leads them to their death. In the photo, this girl also changes depending on how many people she killed. For example, if she killed three people, she will eerily be shown holding up, you guessed it, three fingers. In our second spot, we have I Feel Fantastic. In 2004, a video titled I Feel Fantastic was uploaded to YouTube. This video features a very, very, very scary mannequin type thing named Tara. Tara can be seen with her body completely still, but just her head and lips moving to the song that plays in the background. Now, Tara is not the best singer, and it sounds like a voice simulator type thing with high pitched beats in the background. The song alone is very agitating to listen to. The robot lady thing was created by John Bergeron, who programmed her to sing the song he writes. Some of the lyrics include, please leave and run, run, run. The shots of Tara are intercut with her in different outfits and outdoor shots. Now, people believe that the creator of Tara has committed murder and that Tara is wearing the victim's clothes. They also believe that the outside random shots that don't seem to tie into the video actually show where the victim's bodies are buried. The creator also left a cryptic message in the video's description. He makes a reference to Pygmalion. Pygmalion was a Greek god who thought women were tainted and unworthy of love. He then decided to build his ideal woman and fell in love with her. People believe Tara was once the woman he loved and when he found out she had too many flaws, he murdered her and created this robot thing to replace her. And in our number one spot, we have the blind maiden. This story gives me the heebie-jeebies, like zoinks. This legend surrounds a website known as blindmaiden.com. I suggest not going on that website, please for your own good. Apparently, it is said that you have no access to this website unless you enter at exactly 12 o'clock AM while being alone in a room with the lights off. If you succeed to meet this criteria, then you will be allowed to access the site. Now, on this site, it is said that you will encounter disturbing images of boys and girls without eyes and with distorted faces. It is said that you have to be careful not to click anything by accident or else you will face the consequences. On this website, you will have two options, accept or decline. If you accept, then the monitor will change and display someone approaching your house. Then the video footage will change again and you will see a live footage of your back as you feel someone behind you. If you turn around, the maiden will rip your eyes out and take your picture. You will then be a part of the numerous other photos of eyeless individuals on the website. My question is, is what if you just don't turn around and face her? Like she's there, you can feel her there, you just don't turn around. Now, if you choose decline, then you are safe from the maiden. 